Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, can we start the session? Yes, please. Yeah. So, uh, dear and respected friend, uh, thank you so much uh, for your kind uh, participation. And uh, we are going to start uh, today's session with an invocation of a song. So, let me just uh, share the screen, please. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, kind attention. This was a song, uh, Kul Geet of uh, BHU, Banaras Hindu University. Uh, dear and respected friend, I Randhir Kumar Gautam, on behalf of uh, Swadhyay Sahachak, Circle of Creative Co-Learning and Vishwanidhan Center for Asian Blue Swimming, welcome you to attend today's talk on the very topic, A.K. Saran on modernity, Indian tradition, and sociology in India. Our the Kishore Saran, who wrote under the name uh, called A.K. Saran, was an eminent and creative sociologist and one of the most important uh, voices in the Hindu world on traditional thought. And uh, A.K. Saran's writings often uh, covered the expositors of uh, uh, traditional teachings and uh, the perennial philosophy. This, this is our second talk on A.K. Saran. In last year, we have uh, organized one talk on A.K. Saran's uh, sociology. So it is an honor and uh, privilege to have uh, available with us our distinguished speaker, Professor Ajit K. Pandey Sahab. Uh, uh, he is uh, a former uh, professor uh, from B Banaras Hindu University. Uh, we are uh, delighted to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Uh, Amit Kumar uh, Sharma, uh, professor uh, from Center for Study of Social System, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, uh, Maruf, uh, creative thinker and our co-nurturer from Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, I can see so many friends here, uh, Professor Tanya from Jindal Global University, Professor Gyan Glui, uh, uh, Professor Anand Kumar will soon, soon join us. Uh, and uh, uh, so I also extend my warm welcome to Professor Anand Kumar Giri, uh, our mentor and honorary trustee of uh, Vishnidhan Center for Asian Blue Swimming. And all the respected participants, viewer, listener, uh, both on Facebook platform, Zoom platform, and also uh, on YouTube platform. Uh, let me introduce the honorable speaker, although uh, Professor Ajit Pandey does not uh, need any introduction. 
he's an eminent uh, sociologist from banaras hindu university and presently uh, he's a honorary visiting professor uh, uh, at uh, giri uh, institute of development studies lucknow and his research area includes uh, social theory and developmental issues critique of subaltern uh, studies kinship tribal policy gender studies and so and so forth um, let me also give a, a brief introduction to our uh, uh, circle this is swadhyay sahachak a circle of for co learning and mutual studies uh, it is an studying of uh, learning together self culture societies and the world friends associated uh, with this are eager to walk and mediate with new horizons of thinking and new movements of social and cultural change at work in our contemporary world we study seekers such as sri arvindo mahatma gandhi chitranjan das a creative soul and creative thinker from orissa and many others uh, from around the world we also present our own writings and reflect upon our creativity together we also invite seekers from different fields of life to share with us their lives vision sadhana and a struggle for uh, uh, struggles for uh, cre creating a world of beauty dignity and dialogue we have collaboration with uh, different universities in india and abroad we are uh, nurturing so many creative uh, 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 programs uh, together and we invite uh, you all to be our co nurturer uh so first i would like to invite uh, professor anand kumar giri to kindly give a, a brief introduction of today's talk so professor giri over to you thank you so much uh, dear randeep and uh, thank you professor ajit kumar pande for joining us and professor amit kumar sharma and maruf dr mohammad maruf saha for nurturing our conversation today with professor ak saran he speak of modernity his engagement with tradition and the whole challenge of constituting uh, creative ways of understanding indian traditions and the world <clears throat> now professor ak saran as professor pande has uh, has presented us in his paper he offers a critique of modernity and he puts forward incompatibility between tradition and modernity and there are very interesting insights from professor uh, saron's critique of modernity for example the whole modern sociology or modernity is built on what uh, anthony giddens calls as post traditional telos now if sociology which is a study of all societies and societies are simultaneously animated by multiple streams you know tradition modernity and the professor uh, saran has not engaged much with post modern dimension but also the contemporary moment is called trans modern as enric dussel suggests and that trans modern moment is a moment in which we are with the present and we are neither a prisoner of tradition or modernity and post modern critique is not enough because post modern critique of modernity seems to be a family quarrel of european modernity with itself so professor saran's critique of modernity as modernity being totally based upon post traditional telos it's interesting and sociology therefore needs to move beyond its post traditional assumptions and develop ontologies epistemologies methodologies in which it can really try to understand all societies in an open way at the same time professor saran's critique of modernity now the question is in professor uh, pandey's paper there is a section called reproaching a case and uh, but i it is an invitation for us to meditate whether reproaching is a modality of engagement or it is a it is a critique of uh, uh, saran's critique of indian traditional modernity 
But what uh, Professor Pandey points to is very important, is that, for example, Professor uh, Saram's you know, construction of Indian tradition and Hinduism, it seems that Professor Saram was not that open to understanding the multiple streams of Indian traditions. You know? And Hinduism is also in its multifarious manifestations, Hinduism, Buddhism, and in a planetary context, for example, the dialogue between Indian civilization, Chinese civilization, African civilizations, you know. So therefore, uh, it seems that Professor Saran's critique of modernity had, quote unquote, a Hindu root, but that needs to be opened up. And, and especially his critique of Islam and uh, Bhakti movement, and uh, as Professor um, Pandey writes, that for Professor Saran, Gandhi was an exception, but Gandhi built on Bhakti movement. And in an interesting way, another cross uh, border crossing way, we can think of uh, Professor uh, Saran's engagement with Indian tradition and cultivation of an alternative sociology. And here bring not only Ananda Kumaraswamy, but also Professor J.P.S. Ubra, you know, his work on Indian tradition and how he, his uh, engagement with Indian tradition has a plurality, you know, Islam, Sikhism. And though, of course, he does not build much on Buddhism, uh, but uh, in terms of thinking with Professor Saran, we need to have this kind of border crossing conversation. For example, how we cultivate a sociological understanding who's not enslaved to European modernity. And Professor Oberoi has a book, European Modernity, Truth, Method, and, uh, and so, uh, so therefore what we are invited to is uh, to learn with Professor Saran in a way, but his critique of modernity, the question is whether it is a self-justifying critique. Professor Pandey himself uh, has a line in his paper where talking about modernity, he is right, it is much disguised nonsense. And, and in a way, it reflects uh, Professor Saram's approach. But uh, when we are part of the journey of knowledge, of course, uh, Professor Saran invites us to be open to the transcendental dimension. But the transcendental dimension of knowledge also has a path of mutual conversation or what I would like to call as mutual validation. So therefore, to condemn wholesale learning as nonsense or it is based on false demises. So we need to engage uh, with Professor Saran's approach to modernity and in a much more open way as we learn with him. So with this, uh, let us uh, join this conversation. So uh, we, I invite Professor Pandey to kindly make his presentation. And if it is okay, you can kindly take up to 30 minutes and then uh, Professor Sarma would join us around 20, 25 minutes. And then uh, Dr. Mohammed Maroof Saha. So we'll try to wrap up our presentation within an hour or so. And then we would have 15, 20 minutes for mutual conversations. So Professor Pandey, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, sir, please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Ah, uh, yes, please. Thank you very much, Professor Giri and uh, uh, Dr. Randeep uh, Gautam Sir, and my friend uh, Professor Amit Sharma uh, from uh, JNU, uh, and the other audience. Uh, First of all, I express my uh, great gratitude to Professor Giri and uh, Randeer Gautam, uh, who has invited me uh, to share my views on Professor Saran's standing on tradition, modernity, and sociology in India with all of you. I'll present very briefly his viewpoint because this is in continuity with my earlier lecture, earlier communications, I believe, one year before. Uh, 
reading uh, repeatedly uh, through his available writings. Uh, fortunately, I have uh, most of his writings, both published and unpublished, with me. Uh, I find that uh, there is in them a process of change in continuity, uh, more exactly transcendence. Uh, though very uh, intensive, it is like a process of growth of a planted seed, if I may say so, through uh, uh, trials of seasons and of uh, years, uh, tribulations. It is wonder how uh, it could survive in such uh, scorching heat and uh, heavy torrential rains and uh, severing cold. There must have been some uh, healing breeze restoring warmth of sunshine. I'm speaking in reference to Professor Saran's positions. Singing birds conveying a melody of consolation. Trees uh, providing sets and stars and moon speaking. Otherwise, how could growth of such a seed, such a personality, such an intellectual is possible? Saran, I'm a state, I'm a state coming to uh, his association with Professor, sorry, uh, Mr. A.K. A. K. Uh, Kumar Swami Sahab Saran was struck by Kumar Swami's statements uh, 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 from his book, Swadeshi's uh, Sincerity, uh, that is in his book, Art and Swadeshi. That was available in his Elder Brothers. That's another story, Elder Brothers uh, Library. It was in Saran's most sensitive. At that period of time, he was perhaps 17 or 18 years old. It, is, it was in Saran's most sensitive early teens. Swadeshi is sincerity. That was a statement in the book by Kumar Swami Sahib. It is mind, early mind, the immature mind, and resounded in his heart time and again. It was a kind of awakening and glimpse of reality of tradition. Though uh, it was still to be recognized, deepened and matured later, because he was only hardly 17, 18 years old. Since then, he continuously read Kumar Swami, which helped Saran to understand uh, tradition intellectually. For this, an initial break was essential. It was of such a nature that this process was personal, existential, and total. This is what I understand and conceive. Uh, here, I'd like to refer to two of his con Saran's contributions that is my my con co communication today, as a matter of fact, will revolve around, revolve around two great contributions by Professor Sharon. One is uh, on sociology in India. Another is the faith of a modern intellectual. Uh, so I'll start from the first book, uh, a paper that was published in one of the edited book uh, books by uh, Rao Sek. This is uh, in the name of contemporary sociology. This paper is published in that book. Sociology in India. This published. Uh, this became published in 1958. Uh, in this uh, first comprehensive and critical paper, Sociology in India, its uh, position is clearly presented in the general context of Indian sociology. Influences of uh, Kumar Swami and another his teacher, D.P. Mukherjee, on Saran are uh, evident uh, through his critical appreciation of them. What is striking is that in this paper, that this paper clearly indicates a stage of his being in a process. In order to understand sociology in India, Saran says, emphasizes time and again, it is important and necessary to see its contextual background, that is the British rule in India, because it has been decisive in shaping characters and features of sociological thinking in modern India. The colonial rule, also uh, meant the encounter between uh, disintegrating traditional society and the modern society that is the foreign rule. According to Saran, Professor Saran, modernization as an impact of uh, conquest by England continues and dominates Indian intellectual thinking. And there have been three kinds of responses to this foreign force, a foreign influence. Number one is the first is the rejection of the modern Western civilization and a return to its traditional principles. Second was uh, a synthesis of the two, that is the modernization and tradition. And the last and third is with the basis of synthesis, accepting the synthesis. Uh, Saran critically appreciates the first and rejects the second and third. 
And the first response represented by Kumar Swami is exceptional because a dominant trend among the intellectuals that period of time was synthesis. Even that continues. Saran introduces Kumar Swami's position, though it is very brief, that is the principles of tradition are first principles and wisdom uncreated. I repeat, principles of tradition are the first principles and the wisdom uncreated. Traditional society is a normal society as per certain uh, understanding based on the first principles. Its distinctive character is order corresponding with that of nature, which is open for possibility of transcending the limitations of individuality, that is the realizations. From the position of the first principles, the modern society is an anomaly, a monstrosity, a murderous machine with no conscience, no ideals, and neither human nor normal nor Christian. And we are moving towards the modern society, which is gradually considered as progress is nothing else but a swift and steady drift towards disaster. This I'm telling you on the basis of my readings of Professor Higeshwar. This is the viewpoint of Professor Saran. Condition of India, Saran says, is very hopeless. What is Kumar Swami's remedy for this lamentable condition of India? Because he was much more influenced by Kumar Swami, Kumar Swami's understanding and perspective. His answer, metaphysically, is a return to the first principles and religious. I'm talking about Kumar Swami's answer. First principles and religiously seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness and all these things shall be added onto you over a period of time. Raising a question of relevance of Kumar Swami's remedy to India, Professor Saran thinks that his answer is clear but superficial. This answer is very superficial because it is not clear what he means it in terms of historical possibility. Further, Saran points out that Kumar Swami has not been fully aware of the predicament of the modern man and the misery of the ordinary Hindu in modern India. Kumar Swami therefore failed to suggest a way out. Saran's uh, uh, criticism of Kumar Swami's position reflects Saran's understanding of Kumar Swami at the particular stage. His understanding of tradition was still too formal to be substantial and essential. It was too horizontal instead of transcendental. His criticism, superficial, not clear in terms of historical possibility, and failure in suggesting a way out may be repeated by others on Saran's present positions. This bitter test seems to be inevitable for the forerunner or the bearer of a tradition, particularly in the modern age. He knows this. That is why he says perhaps it is not a question of discovering a way out, but of suffering at the end of his exposition on, on Kumar Swami. But it was, it was quite clear that his state of uh, pilgrimage was firmly taken and he could neither go back nor go any other way except at the cost of his soul. Uh, this is clearly seen in his confrontation with sociology in India, including D.P. Mukherjee, his teacher. As a traditionalist, Saran was aware of futility and danger of modern thinking and modernization and their incompatibility with tradition. Therefore, he was against a general trend of modern sociology and social sciences. It was explicitly stated in just a joint letter of six special social scientists of Lucknow University to the press. He was one of the signatories. And I, I just like to present some significant viewpoints out of this letter. Persons familiar with the writings of such thinkers, for instance, Sorokin, Oeglin, Wiener, Langer, Kumar Swami, Rene Go, Chuan, will have no hesitation in asserting that in bringing our world to this helpless state, the methods, the orientations, and underlying values of modern social sciences have played an important part. They had serious doubts, these thinkers that I have referred to about the theoretical validity of modern method of empirical research. Saran felt accurately, uh, act, act, <coughs> actually this problem raising a question that is that was recurrently disturbing him. Do we then accept the value that have the world to the brink of utter annihilation? According to uh, Professor Sharon, 
the Indian sociologist as well as the Indian economist did not see the dreadful urgency of these questions. Deepi Mukherjee was one of the exceptions, uh, seeing this intellectually in his later writings, but he has stopped at analysis, still holding a synthesis, which is in what Professor Sharon alleged him time and again. The lack of intellectual seriousness in Sharon's thinking uh, is Sharon, uh, 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 this is what Sharon thinks about Professor D.P. Mukherjee, a common characteristics of modern thought and the predicament of the modern intellectual. So this essay on sociology in India is comprehensive because it includes the basic themes with which Saran is concerned and which appear continuously in his writings. This essay ends with an enigmatic question. Is there a way out for him if he did attend to these questions, that these questions are dreadful urgency of the questions. This shows his own predicament. Now, uh, I, 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 I quote, I present here one of the paragraphs from the uh, article that he writes, the misery of the ordinary Hindu thinker in modern India, whose consciousness, consciousness and socio-cultural world are still haunted by vestiges of a normal civilization and who now living under the total impact of civilization that is obviously irrational, finds that all his efforts is consistent thinking and normal living constantly resulting, resulting in an aesthetic form of life and thought, that all is avoidance of mere ornament, gifts and on turning into interior decoration. This is the, this is the small paragraph salvaged from his article, this I brought to you. This unbridgeable, unbridgeable uh, gap between an individual who tries to live uh, authentically and society in decay under onslaught of inhuman and irrational modern civilization torments a person like Professor Sarah. It is almost an impossible task to live authentically in such a society. But that acute awareness of the predicament and conflicts reflects Sarah's condition no way other than a continuous return to the first principles are moving forward. It is a very significant in this context that, this, that Sharon was aware of the influence of Mahatma Gandhi as an exceptional person who lived uh, courageously in such an impossible world as a forerunner or a bearer of the tradition. I believe this paper, Sociology in India, sufficiently indicates Sharon's pilgrimage process towards traditions. This is a very small cause of positive time, I can't explicate it. Saran's next paper, that is the faith of a modern intellectual that was published in the form of a booklet as far back as 1959 by a small publisher from uh, Lucknow, Ram Advani, is a remarkable paper revealing a fascinating dialogue between D.P. Mukherjee, one of his most outstanding teachers, in the universities of modern India, that is Lucknow University, and Sharon, one of uh, Mukherjee's most distinguished students. It is actually, if you read it, it's a moving experience to read, read it uh, uh, through, uh, because such an intellectually vigorous, sharp dialogue concerned with the contemporary issues, vital to the density of making between a teacher and a student in universities is rare and hard to expect. It must have been a great boon for students, particularly for Professor Saran, to be with such a, a powerful teacher as Professor D.P. Mukherjee for a few years in the university. It is a kind of eye-opening experience if you read it, to read it uh, through, because such a dialogue is possible only among authentic teachers and authentic students. And moreover, the positions held by Mukherjee and Saran are mutually incompatible. That's why it's very significant, I like to, uh, bring back your home some of the you know the uh, uh, contents of this uh, book before you. It is surprising and very painful. The contents are very surprising and painful. Saran moves with Mukherjee along his analysis of the issues crucial to our days, admiring his extraordinarily able survey, which is a rare combination of historical precision and a penetrating analysis, brilliance and devastating uh, criticism and then departs with great pain, very heavy heart from him and a puzzle from Mukherjee because of his faith in the emergence of new man. 
Uh, Professor Mukherjee was a strong faith in the emergence of, and he was expecting the emergence of a new man over a period of time. And the new society in the socialist order that pinned Professor Mukherjee time, seven time and again. Mukherjee surrenders his analytic power to this faith. Professor Saron speaks of, and cannot see obvious contradictions in the socialist order as well as the incompatibility of tradition with the socialist order. It's what he alleges his teacher in his dialogue. Mukherjee's analysis of the two specific regions of Gandhi's opposition uh, to a technological civilization is truly brilliant as Saron admits with admiration. <clears throat> First one is the intimate connection between the increasing large scale use of machinery and exploitation. And the second one is that between the large scale technological society and the negation of normal social order. Based on the principles of wantlessness and non-responsiveness. Uh, <clears throat> Mukherjee clearly sees that Gandhi's objection to technology is not the possibility of the misuse but it's incompatibility with the social system that we individuals, we Indians were surviving worthy of the human beings. Gandhi was quite aware of the basic connection between the, the, the <coughs> developments of technology and the exploitation of mind by man and therefore negate an assumption commonly shared by the two schools that is the Marxist and non-Marxist about the compatibility of increasing technological power and universal human welfare. Saran stands with Gandhi's view and argues for it because in this record, Gandhi represents the principles of traditions over against those of modern ideas. Technological civilization being centered on autopothesis, rejects traditional norm on self-control and prayer, and therefore is utterly incompatible with the traditions. Accordingly to Professor Saran, Mukherjee sees this very clearly that he stops at analysis and finds the solution in a synthesis that is socialist order. That's why he always uh, stands against his guru, Professor Mukherjee. Now Mukherjee's intellectual avoidance of uh, confrontation is uh, demonstrated again in his essay, the another essay that I'm bringing back here, the philosophy of Indian history. He is critical of historians of India because they neglected the story of culture inseparable from the history of uh, her religious quest, concentrating on political history. This superficial and barren study of history was due to influence of the West. But yet Mukherjee sees Indian history in terms of class struggle in a Marxist style. Saran raises a fundamental question. What is history based on the traditional Indian point of view? The answer uh, is found uh, in a quotation, a quotation from Kumar Swami, time, and that is there in time and eternity. So the fundamental feature of the principles of traditions I'm presenting here, the quotation, this is uh, taken from Kumar Swami's uh, contributions, or Kumar Swami's views on time and eternity. He speaks of the non-spatial and non-temporal intuition is a condition of the interpretation of the space time and the world itself. This transcendental intuition is essential in the interpretation of history from the position of tradition. The rightful insight, uh, this is what I uh, just spoke out, will be extremely difficult to comprehend without having a glimpse of the intuition, that is the transcendental intuition. All states of being seen in principle are simultaneous in the eternal now. The transcendental intuition as the condition of interpretation of history cannot be compatible with the Marxian interpretation of the history. And Sharon states his position very clearly. And this is why that I'm once again, I, I quote Professor Sharon. He says that this is in the first, uh, in fact, no halfway house between the tradition directed and the other directed societies. For in reality, the other is counterfeit of the tradition. Thus the way to the transcendental intuition becomes crucial. Here again, Saran is exposed to a predicament. There does not appear to be uh, any genuine method of uh, reactivating the traditional ideals by human effort and tra traditionalism itself can be no more than an acronym today. This decay of tradition indicates that there is no way out. It is a perplexing condition. Therefore, a fresh frank despair brought by the darkness of this time is inevitable. 
But this despair has enough clear cons consciousness to discern falsify of the uh, falsity of the faith of a modern intellectual. This marvelous dialogue between Mukherjee and Saran ends with a quotation. Quotation I am quoting. The only hope or else despair lied in the choice of fire or fire to be redeemed from fire by fire. I repeat once again, the only hope or else uh, despair lied in the choice of fire and fire to be redeemed from fire by fire. This is what the uh, result out of the dialogue between Professor Mukherjee and Saran. The only way to uh, the transcendental uh, Intuition is a life of ordeal from fire by fire. It is according to Saren, a state in which man, while living and suffering in his own historical time, preserves a consciousness of the unreality of time and it's open to the myth of eternal uh, return. Uh, it is a constant endeavor to have right understanding and to act completely in academic, in accordance with it. This exposes the basic tone in Saran's life and writings. Uh, I name it as a, uh, if I may say so, as a pilgrimage or a pilgrimage process towards tradition. However, Saran himself identified it as a ontological question or ontology in religion and society in his contributions probably of Hindu view, uh, published as far well back as 1965. This term is found in Kumar Swami's writings. Uh, with which uh, Saran has been much familiar. A puzzle remains why he did not use it before 1965, since the meaning of the term adopted was corresponding to his fundamental experience. Uh, a possible explanation to me, uh, this appears, is that he was not yet fully, uh, that period of time, convinced of the correspondence between these two before he reached a certain uh, milestone in his pilgrimage. So, uh, these are uh, uh, certain uh, viewpoints in a very uh, succinct manner that uh, I try to bring back home here in this discussion of mine. And the rest of the things, the paper is there and the, already circulated to all of you. You can read and ask the questions I'm ready to answer. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Giri and uh, Professor Dr. Gautam uh, and other listeners, my friend, Professor uh, Sharma. Thank you very much. My paper is over. My presentation is over now. Thank you. You can have the discussions. I'm ready to answer any questions that you present before. Thank you so much, Professor Pandey. So now we invite Amit, please, Amit, to share your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Professor Pandey, Professor Giri, Professor Anand Kumar, and friends. Uh, I do not know how to begin because of uh, three constants. Uh, I have read Professor Pandey's uh, uh, earlier publication and I have listened to him today. Uh, I came to know about Saran's existence in Indian sociology. Uh, when I was a student uh, of uh, Buddhism at Bodh Gaya. And uh, that was not from a Buddhist. It was from a book. Uh, my first book in sociology by Ram Krishna Mukherjee, Sociology of Indian Sociology. Uh, in 1979, and uh, before I joined as a classmate of Ananta Giri in Delhi School of Economics in 1984, uh, I tried to meet Professor Saran uh, through three great people. Uh, one was Shukla, second was Professor Tiwari, uh, both are well known to Professor Anand Kumar. And uh, then I decided to uh, include sociology within my training process. 
before that i was a student of buddhism i had already got initiation in buddhism in 1975 when i met him uh, i was silent and he was speaking and as professor pande has also said i i thought i am not uh, a supatra to probe his mind i asked only three simple questions number 1 why you are so angry sir now that was the time of amitabh bachchan in indian cinema and uh, Uh, i did not understand why people call him angry uh, angry young man the real angry young person the one hand was ek saran always angry the other was indira gandhi a youth icon in 1969 and uh, by 74 youth movement started against her professor anand kumar had been part of this history but now i have a different view all together which is not in contradiction with what vinadas wrote about him in critical events when she compared ak saran with louis dumo or you know i i i have nothing to say about the uh, of sociology uh, community sociological community at large but i would like to just draw your attention to three simple facts number 1 when you are a courageous person a moral person it is not very easy to digest an altogether new view different view and what was his problem that he was angry that why sociologists now delhi and bombay we are not taking thinking of indian sociology seriously uh, to make it more simple why dp mukherjee and gs bhuriye radha kamal mukherjee and uh, kapadia yeah, even nirmal bos we are not in a dialogue with sarkar bnc now saran has not written much about it but in my personal conversation he said very very explicitly i have three problems and that is the source of my anger number one people have blindly accepted erroneous view propounded by manuel kant that reality in itself or noumena we understood in other words he was against phenomenology of social sciences whether it is practiced in india or elsewhere he was a traditional person uh, yes initially he was a traditional hindu but uh, when he came in contact with buddhism at uh, sarnath kirtan higher institute sarnath he also came in contact with uh, you know the sia scholar sayyad hussain nasir 
and this Tibetan Buddhist and uh, the Shiite scholars, the group around Sayyid Hussein Nasri in Iran, opened his eyes. He had moral courage with three people at the same time. One was of Kumar Swami, which had been already presented. The second was critical conversations, engagements with D.P. Mukherjee. But the third was transformation in the ontology, epistemology, methodology, and substantive work on civilizations in Radha Kamal Mukherjee. Radha Kamal Mukherjee began with uh, normal Western sociology, but by 60s, he, he was, you know, transformed. And many people have not written about him, uh, whether it is Yogendra Singh or uh, T.K. Women's uh, edited book on Indian sociology or even Ram Krishna Mukherjee. They just at best mentioned the bibliography, but five works of Radha Kamal had a very important uh, positive or uh, uh, negative uh, influence on Saran. And these books were Symbolic Life of Man, Decline of Civilization, Destiny of Civilization, and Cosmic Art of India. Of nature, culture, uh, in his earlier book, ecology. Although, of personal reasons, since uh, Radha Kamal and D.P. Mukherjee were not uh, talking much in the same department, uh, pragmatically, Saran decided. Like Professor D.P. Mukherjee and D.N. Majumdar and D.N. Madan to ignore the later achievements of Radha Kamal. Instead, he was trying to make with nobody mentions either Heidegger or Nietzsche in the development of either European classical sociology or Indian sociology until 1990s. But Heidegger is a very important influence on A.K. Saran. Why? Because one end was making a little critique of Immanuel Kant and his, you know, uh, uh, Kantian revolution in philosophy or social sciences at par with Copernican uh, revolution that uh, we cannot study reality as it is, that is beyond the techniques, methods, theories, paradigms available to social sciences anywhere. But most European scholars primarily those who are working in other languages like Danish, German, French, and Polish, and Russian, they were taking this philosophical breakthrough very seriously, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Heidegger on the one hand, and Schopenhauer on the other, they were trying to get the source of Gandhi, William Morris, John Ruskin, and Tolstoy. Therefore, I think uh, we are yet to begin a systematic study of uh, A.K. Saran because literature is not easily available. Of course, we have 10 volumes published from Sarnath, and there are many papers available at Lucknow and with Professor Pandey. It requires an intellectual uh, project to understand A.K. Saran, 
because he writes in three languages. The normal language of sociology is one. Second is the mythic language, which was studied by Levi Strauss in his, you know, uh, later period. He, his books myth, uh, uh, on myths and mythology. And the third is uh, he is using the metanomy, you know, uh, or metanoia and autology. I will explain in, in, in few minutes uh, what I have written when Professor Pandey was uh, reading his paper. Uh, I will uh, uh, come to the uh, first. Uh, uh, my assessment of A.K. Saran, this is point four in my, in my note of Professor Pandey's uh, presentation. A.K. Saran was a classical sociologist of comparative civilizations. But besides G.S. Gurie, his book, Cities and Civilizations, and three volumes by Radha Kamal Mukherjee, other Indian sociologists had settled to a study either different state or the partitioned society of India. Saran rightly agreed. He said that you cannot study India as a civilization without making a serious engagement with what is called Sark countries. Because the Indian history is not necessarily the history of nation state. And in a civilization, there are four elements. People talk only about two, nation state and civil society. But since he had you know, engaged with uh, Herbert Spencer, he brought the concept of military society as a complementary concept of civil society and then he said a state versus the market he said although it is not very neatly articulated in saran but i have written it in my hindi publications hind swaraj ki prasangikta bhartiya sanskriti ka swarup indology in india as a discipline and, and indology as a method in indian sociology and uh, my paper uh, about uh, you know study of indian civilization therefore those who are interested they can refer to that uh, here i wanted to stress that what makes saran different was not only his engagement with modernity and tradition but but his emphasis that we should make civilization as the starting point of social science inquiry Traditional side village models. A.K. Saran was a classical sociologist of comparative civilizations, traditional side village models at the end of his, his, his career. Second, his autology is already well established methodology of theory production, classical sociology. However, it is mostly implicit or known by different names. For example, ontology of A.K. Saran is homologous, homologous to biography in sociological imaginations of C. Wright Mills. Uh, B, it is social actors Verstehen in Max Weber's historical sociology of law. C, it is unique view in social anthropology. D, it is Indology in sociology of Louis Dumont. D, it is being in Heidegger and post structuralist E, it is Westology in J.P.S. Uberai. West in us in Ravindra Rage in the European shadow. G, it is thinker in Kishor Mahubani's and Asians think. It is the self in Hamid, the uh, Sabid, and non Europeans think. A.K. Saran was a camp follower of A.K. Kumar Swami, Sociology of India, Ram Krishna Mukherjee in his Sociology of Indian Sociology, 
outlined the contributions of Kumar Swami as one of the founding fathers of Indian sociology with B.K. Sarkar, G.S. Bhurye, Radha Kamal Mukherjee, ATL. And my last point is that A.K. Saran was the conscious pioneer of Westology in India who collaborated with Marco Pallis, Sayyad Hussain Nasr, Dharam Pal, and Samdong Rinpoche. I think I should end because I have made, uh, you know, my points in the limited time allotted to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali, for bringing many deep thoughts together. Thank you. We'll cultivate some of these ideas during our conversation. Now, Maruf Bhai, please. Salam Alaikum. Alaikum, sir. Fine. Good evening. Wonderful. I'm so delighted that you have organized this again on Siren. And we had a pleasure to listen from our Pandeji and now Sharmanji. It was wonderful. I wanted them to listen more to them, but they have stopped our misfortune. <clears throat> I stopped it because uh, Professor Sharma is very particular in time. Uh, he doesn't want anybody else exceeding the time period. Time allotted for me was uh, uh, allotted for me was only half an hour time. So I thought I must confine myself within 25 minutes. So I stipulated period of time I completed and uh, handed yeah. over those talks. Under under provocation, I will add one more line. Please, you know, the, the thing is that time in a space, time in a space add primary category of civilizational analysis is central in social sciences, but it is taken for granted. For example, time for Max Weber is money. Time is money. He borrowed it from Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin borrowed it from Calvin. But for A.K. Saran, for Sayyid Hussein Nasr, for His Holiness uh, Dalai Lama, for uh, many uh, uh, new people, uh, for example, Ivan Illich, uh, Pope Francis, time is not money, rather, time is a dimension of divinity. And this dimension cannot be understood without a space. A space for most European sociologists is inert, lifeless. But for non-Europeans, earth is the extension of goddess body. Whether, uh, you know, it is Tara of Buddhism or Tripur Sundari of uh, Sakta Sampradaya, or Kamakshi of uh, South Indian uh, Dravidian Hinduism, or Durga of North India. Therefore, space and time, uh, you know, as concepts for Saran, Westerners in Indian body, is qualitatively different and it should be taken seriously. Third, for uh, A.K. Saran, this one did not consist only of four elements, that is, the military society, the civil society, the market and, uh, and nation state. But he also said that there are, at a higher level, the elements of any civilization, qua civilization. He did not consider that modernity has been able to produce a civilization. At best, it is an empire. You know, it is uh, some sort of settlement. Uh, modernity can produce only settlements like United States of America or New World. Civilization is not possible without cumulative of wisdom. And this is there in Horkheimer and Adorno's dialectics of civilization as well. Therefore, I will not say uh, A.K. Saran is something very unique in the global village. He is one of the one of the very important voices who can who can champion the cause of multicultural global village 
multiple modernities, plural ways of expressing the same thing, what Kumar Swami articulated in figures of speech and figures of thought. It was just a response to my friend. Because then Yes, Maru Bhai, please. Thank you. Yes, it was again a pleasure. See, I, a few points that I was in a way reminded of while listening to both Pandeji and Sharmaji. First, how uneducated are Indian sociologists who do not study Saran? And I know many departments of sociology professors there who are not bothered at all about Saran. So that means we have not taken traditional Indian sociology seriously or major modern critiques of sociology as it has evolved. For example, Heidegger, who was an influence on Saran, I think that makes him distinctive among his traditionalist scholars because none of the major traditionalist philosophers have been in a way engaging with Heidegger to that extent. Uh, they have been mostly dismissive, but uh, I know his uh, Saran's own, in this vast, Saran's own perspective also diverges significantly from him. But the point is he has engaged in, with major modern voices and that makes him compelling and worthy of note by everyone. So I wonder why so little has been done on Saran. So why he's not being taken seriously. So I think that is one of the problems that Saran lamented about the huge modern ignorance. You know, Gui Noon, for example, his comments about modern civilization were far more, we can say, far more serious than even Gandhi when he said it's an interesting civilization. So Gui Noon said it is not a civilization at all. Uh, yes, anomaly. And then he had, in, a way, in his crisis of the modern world and the reign of quantity and other works, he has, in a way, tried to show the uh, bankruptcy and poverty of these major modern ideas. And when we see the dismissal of the tradition, traditional institutions, and a very specious framing of the great ideas of traditional Indian society. For example, take the case of caste and take the case of those four divisions of life and what we call as Saudharma, vacation and art as initiation. The key theme is, for example, that Kumaraswamy, in a way, argued so forcefully, every man is an artist. Now we know that in modernity, art becomes a commodity as, and then we see, so our education has been fundamentally delinked from art. To be truly a human being is to be open to the transcendence. Now, now Eric Vogelin, who was one of the most important modern political philosophers, has also been ignored. Very few people know him. And he had articulated this insight better. So I wish we could in future propose studies in which Saran and Vogelin are put in dialogue. Saran and other major thinkers. For example, Nasser. Nasser, I know better. I had an opportunity to write on him many pieces and to follow his work. And he has in a way uh, evolved from, from a traditional point in general and an Islamic point in particular. This the same critique of modernity and modern institutions. Now, the first point is, do we take that critique seriously? Do we take Shuan, for example, seriously? We know how devoted Sasaran was to Shuan. On his one sentence, he has a whole essay, Shuan sentence. Now, why Saran is so important? We know so many critiques, so many, so much discussion on Indian secularism, secularism in India. But then mostly Saran is missing in, in those public debates. And we know how seminal is his essay on the meaning of secularism. Without understanding it in that particular perspective, so much ink that is sprinkled on, the, on this point what is secularism, how we, how we are to go and fight communalism and all this. So we see the poverty of these modern disciplines. As the people that have taken sociology and empirical research and 
then we have accepted that framing of our work. So transcendence is no longer at the center and that we know, for example, from drug abuse to general uh, alienation from work, to disappearance of the very idea of vocation and the idea that we are fundamentally here to glorify God. And we know his wonderful appropriation, his, his wonderful uh, attempt to situate Gandhi in his context and try to argue for him. Gandhi has few takers today, especially his critique of industry and techno technological culture and all that. Who is, the, who is going to take seriously sudden on the point that technology is not just a means, but the very thing that has to be in a way taken far, with far more skepticism. For example, the Heidegger, the question concerning technology, sudden reformulates it in his own way and the, it is a far more fundamental critique of technology. But we know development and technology are two terms that everyone in a way, but they are, they are drilled from television to every this. In fact, the reign of television is itself a sign of melody. That is a problematic. In fact, the, I recall even Heidegger, who's, who had in a way, someone has commented that the very idea that we are discussing Heidegger is itself a part of nihilism. It's a problem. Deeper things are not in a way conversations the way we are holding. For example, even this Zoom, this is possible only when we have already accepted that we have fall, we have fallen from a particular height that we that we had been bequeathed, that we had in, inherited. So great traditions advocate a major of man, where he's open to transcendence, where community is at the center, not state and not the individual. Now we know either a state or the I, I, either state or the individual, for example, in capitalist model or in socialistic model, but where community is at the center, that is the tradition's basic point of departure. And who constitutes us? We're constituted in that interpersonal openness and ultimately by openness to, to God. God, in fact, is the ground of our real personhood. So it with, without God, you cannot be, have a good season. That's impossible. Now, what is God? God is reality. It's not a personal God whom we can say Buddhism is silent about, Jainism does not talk about, or even Vedantic philosophers would do away with. So the, the centrality of the supreme science of metaphysics, for every one who says he's analyzing society as a sociologist, but if he's not serious about the cross-cultural, the comparative understanding of man, there is a good, I'm just reminded of a very good work in which concept of man, Raju, is edited and some other editor just forgot. So when we see where in every major culture and traditional civilization, man has been understood in fundamentally divergent terms than that of modernity and the sociology that has in a way this uh, scumped to its understanding of man, which is highly reductionistic. So when he uses mythic language, for example, Saran, very few people, few, very few, few people can follow him. We know myth is the pre-ultimate truth, as Kumara Swami elaborated. And Saran is able to wonderfully uh, in, in, use that in his great work. That's why they appear dense and obstruse. That only speaks how narrow we are. We are unable to even understand this, for example, this folklore, this myths, they are the metaphysics of the common people. But we now, we then we try to explain them away from a particular rationalistic point of view, this and that. So that shows how, if if we could take serious initiatives in new education policy and try to give more space to such thinkers, I think he, from after Kumara Swami, A.K. Sarn is the most important philosopher of India in the perspective in which traditional civilizations need to be first situated. It is not our choice that we reject or we do this or that. How we, but the first point is to understand where we are situated. I was just the comment about this history that Pandeji, what, what it is primarily. So the, the tragedy of the modern culture is history is at the center, but we do not know history's connection with the eternity, with what, what we can, 
the history is itself a projection of what we can call trans historical that eternal what we can call uh, the trans, that intuition of being that is so central about which heidegger limited we have forgotten and so if we are a, we, so we the problem is we have highlighted history but that history has already been in a way emptied of its connection with transcendental with what transcends history what history aspires towards that far of horizon that is god that is the realization of values so that is one of the one of my points and another point that i think the popardi ji the way he highlighted with this on his critique of kumara swami on the point that he didn't have a precise blueprint of how it is to be applied this traditional indian some ideas about kumara swami i think that can be that that was left to saran and others to evolve then kumara swami's basic task was to explain the may more major fundamental concepts which had been of almost obscure from the general so i think that is uh, fundamentally his is an appreciation of kumara swami and carrying his legacy forward and trying to unfold what kumara swami couldn't and there is no fundamental in a way in a way uh, divergence between saran and kumara swami on that point if i am informed correctly and another point uh, i wanted to raise is and that should be the last point how he interpreted both crisis of hinduism and the and meaning of gandhi and then this, this now that is hugely important in the current setting the point is where we all agree if we are able to really communicate with each other this this is in fact the point of from from socrates to um, what we call this great sociologist who is so influential in contemporary discourse habermas you can have differences on many points but the point is that communicative dialogue if we are really rational creatures and can talk to each other without biases without prejudice we should be able to agree on the fundamentals but the point is we have not been able to bring on the table what those fundamentals are why we why every human being by definition seeks to transcend himself and society is just a facilitator for that in fact politics is the art of doing that in fact if you read on politics by aristotle the point is we are here to get eudaimonia that that enlightenment that higher meaning of our being here and politics is the art of making it happen so so politics is fundamentally a, an arrangement to have to win our salvation facilitate us now how far we are from that idea of politics which is presupposed in traditional uh, understanding the point is for this we need to evolve a dialogue that saran had elaborated for example saran would saran would say for few weeks we assemble and meet in a certain space and read some traditional texts a great traditional scripture scriptural texts and meditate on them and then what will happen that was his point but saran had argued he had argued that we would be invited to live together for a period of two or three weeks or so that should study and discuss among themselves some wisdom books or their passage to deepen their understanding the idea is as saran says not to inform but to form the mind and you to desediment re- renew and redeem the experience feeling life and imagination realm of the participants now is there any setting is there any seminar for that in any way in the world or we are just going to present our papers and just debate certain things but the most important things are not in a way being discussed heidegger lamented that we have yet to think in the what is called thinking that we are not ready to think in science cannot think the problem is can we think and saran e will be our great guide in that thank you so much Thank you so much, Madhu. <laughs> Now let's have a think on this thing speech. So I invite friends to please share their thoughts on this. Maybe to initiate conversation with my friends around who are pleased. 
Uh, he is not in the meeting. He has to go to Germany. So uh, he sent a message that he will. Okay. 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 So then I request friends to share the dedicated willingness in the chat box. Or your voice is not very clear, Professor Giri. You are not audible. So, dear and respected friend, if you have any question or query, please indicate me in the chat box. Uh, so, we can invite some friends uh, present here. Uh, I can see Professor Tanya uh, from Jindal Global University. I request uh, uh, Professor Tanya to kindly share some of her views. Good, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot for this wonderful presentation. Really very interesting. Uh, if I may ask, uh, my question is that, um, my question concerns actually the connection between, because I'm now reading, uh, uh, making actually doing research on Amrita Sitha, uh, if I pronounce it correct. Amrita Sitha is a 11th century treatise which is a kind of a hybrid between uh, Nata Yoga and uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, you were uh, speaking about like the space, perception of space and time as the body of the goddess. Uh, so in uh, this treatise, because I'm actually looking on what tantric vision and what tantric worldview also the uh, Shakta Tantra can mean for environmental restoration and whether the yogic path from Tantra can mean, can help the reconnecting with nature. So my belief that it is a, a possible and very viable path, uh, but I'm trying to understand this kind of uh, micro macro cosmic correspondence in uh, uh, Tantra Yoga, which enabled uh, yogas, yogis to see, to perceive the entire universe as a kind of located within their own yogic body. So within the energy body, they could make pilgrimage, like physical pilgrimage, uh, geographical pilgrimage to these sacred places, but they could also do pilgrimage within their own, um, within their own uh, energy body and discover the same sacred places within the energy body. So I wonder like what you, uh, I think Dr. Sharma made a comment on the understanding of space and time within a traditional tantric vision. So my question is like, uh, can you see the possibility of applying this traditional understanding of space and time for uh, reuniting with nature and for reconnecting with nature? And reconnecting with nature, not only in a kind of abstract way, but in also in a way of practical environmental restoration of finding motivation to uh, protect nature as one's own extended body. Uh, I think it is a very good question. And if I'm allowed five minutes, I have the following to say. Number one, uh, in tantric vision of civilization, there are three elements. One is nature, mm -hmm. second is being, and uh, there are 84 lakhs of uh, human forms or jiva, and third is divinity. Therefore, nature, being or jiva and divinity or brahma now mm -hmm. uh, this is not unique to uh, only hindu tantra or uh, sufi tantra or uh, uh, i must say buddhist uh, sakta sufi but also 
it is a very important element of Jewish cosmology and they call it Kabbalah and Christian mysticism primarily associated with the Orthodox Church. This is number one. Second, there are technical terms which we have to uh, translate in modern language of social sciences. For example, what is mantra? Uh, the usual translation by Orientalist and Indologist is that mantra is a formula. I think this is wrong. And uh, uh, there is a book, uh, The Treasury of uh, Traditional Wisdom, which mm -hmm. bridges this gap, which uh, my friends were talking about. And uh, what is mantra in any traditional uh, community called religion in Turkhimian term? Mantra is the theory of energy, primarily energy at para, pasyanti, madhyama, and vakhari. Uh, and it is not only limited to saktaj, but also to sufis. Uh, for example, in al-Ghazali, in Rumi, uh, uh, the Buddhist uh, Nagarjuna, Sarhapad, who reaches the gap between the Nath, Panth, and uh, Bajrayan, uh, Machendranath, Gurakhnath, Jalandharnath, etc. Uh, therefore, we have to understand that uh, in traditions of every variety, it is the community which is the unit of analysis and not man or family. Therefore, Ferdinand Tonnage book, Community and Society, should be the first social science work to negotiate truth and not reality. All traditions engage with truth, not social reality or reality. What is the difference between truth and reality? Truth is Brahma reality or naumena can be studied as empirical reality plus abilities in sadhana yoga and for maybe a this possibility is model building therefore we have two tasks one to study the called modern or post-traditional landscape or telos, but also to a study of comparative civilizations or settlements or formations, social formations, where a different type of uh, perspective called epistemology or, uh, you know, methodology is involved. For example, uh, for modern people, humanism is a very great idea. But in case you call a traditional Muslim or traditional Buddhist or traditional uh, Russian Orthodox Church person or to a traditional Hindu, it is, it, is, it is the greatest insult or abuse you are capable of, uh, you know, uh, inflicting on the uh, person. And second thing is, you know, first is mantra. That is theory of energy, uh, many energy, but primarily sound energy. And what is Tantra? Tantra is technology of energy. And what is Yantra, which is the primary tool of Tantra? Instruments. Y yantra is instrument, or Yantra are instruments preserve and promote energy fields in the living beings. Now, uh, this is, uh, you know, the second uh, point. The first point is that uh, there are, you know, three elements in traditions uh, where time and space can be understood from traditional perspective. That is time in nature, time in the being, Time in the divinity. Second, 
there are four types of languages which traditional people speak one is bakhri the spoken word or written word second is symbolic language or mythic language third is transcendental communication without medium and fourth is communication with silence his holiness the dalai lama had given some lectures on this at harvard university long back now the last thing which i would like to draw your attention to is that in case you are engaged with this question uh, from tantra yoga point of view you should read uh, the kashmir uh, person uh, his name is uh, abhinav gupta and primarily he has many works uh, but uh, but i will recommend you know tantra sar or tantra lok two books are much more important than others stop here thank you so much thank you for your advice uh, dr shop really amazing thank you Amit and uh, Amit, so can we slowly can bring our energy together? <clears throat> so, any other friend, please? Ah, uh, Gyan Luigi. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. It was really amazing, and well, I I noted very many things. Perhaps I will limit now. my questions uh, my question to to a point which uh, interests me but uh, but all the points were very very interesting uh, anyway uh, what uh, what uh, uh, i was impressed by is uh, among other things the um, the possible the relations between sadhana and kumaraswami because uh, kumaraswami has uh, many had many many of course relations with uh, history of greek philosophy with plato platonism neoplatonism and i was uh, reflecting on the point of which uh, if i have uh, if i have not heard badly uh, that uh, one of the aspects is to to find the mind anew and i think that this uh, is a common relation with uh, with plato too because also the the myth uh, the image of the cave is uh, one way of suggesting that the individual the subject has to complete change his disposition towards reality and therewith also to to find and to found his mind he knew is to change completely his orientation and disposition towards reality and well i were uh, very very interested in uh, knowing a little bit more about the uh, relations and the influence which kumaraswami had on uh, on saran uh because this is uh, in my opinion a point of an aspect of uh, enormous uh, influence also on the western culture and the relation and the similarities between this aspect and the western culture are uh, very impressive as far as i have thought so thank you very much uh, for uh, the brilliant interventions and thank you thank you Thank you, Gyan Luigi. Now, because of the paucity of time, Sarandhir and Nathi, I request both Professor Randen to take no questions and share some thoughts at the end. Sarandhir and Nathi, please. Uh, thank you. I ju- I have just uh, a kind of uh, brief uh, uh, question about uh, from. Uh, Uh, professor ajit pande and professor uh, sharma ji uh, about uh, a kind of you know uh, ak saran uh, 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 played a very important role in the very shaping of sociology of knowledge uh, in india and uh, i could uh, i can say he is a kind of new almenheim first 
so the question is about a kind of uh, uh, is there any uh, way to differentiate uh, uh, belief from knowledge uh, because uh, uh, the whole problem or the contestation between uh, you know whole uh, a kind of uh, uh, right wing and uh, Uh, what uh, uh, A. K. Saran talks about secular ide ideologists, they have a confrontation. Uh, I think because of this uh, uh, understanding or lack of understanding between the belief uh, of from uh, belief and knowledge. So, if he draw some light on the very uh, issue, thank you. Thank you, Randeep. Minati, please. <laughs> Hello, am I audible? Uh hello yes. am i audible yeah, yeah. yes good good evening everyone um i thank uh, both our chief speaker for a very insightful presentation just i had one query actually it is not a query just i wanted to know a little bit about when professor amit kumar was telling about you no know, the civilization to make the social inquiry just i want him to expand on that point how it is uh, being done and apart from when we was talking about time it is i was just thinking about the recent controversies going on kali you know that is the dimension of time that uh, that kali is you know beyond the all the cyclical time of an ineffable dimension of time and all so it, that, that is the, the ultimate nature of existence or eternity of kali is joined to mahakal like they say so there is an enormous effort to understand kali and different dimension when he was telling the dimension of dignity i just want to know that dimension of dignity it is whether it is lies beyond the time and space i mean pardon if my ignorance if i am asking very this is my doubt and uh, and thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you so you been a very good thought so to this journey of conversation i have to bring one two thoughts one is that amit uh, made reference to heidegger's influence on ekesar so this is insightful now but how do we engage with heidegger amit refers to heidegger's critic of kant so heidegger's critic of kant is one way of understanding kant but does it exhaust the possibility of kant now heidegger challenges us for many things his critic of technology his view on time and authenticity now professor pande say that you know from kumarswami saran learned how to live authentically and sincerely but living sincerely in any field in any field of life is a calling now how the in a society with caste domination as destruction of life so therefore if we take civilization unit of analysis as what i am in say that every document of civilization is a document of barbarism and what challenging us and amit refers to military society as a component of society therefore the intricate relationship between civilization and violence so we that relations civilization and violence how do we still cultivate life and therefore engagement with heidegger also needs to be accompanied by an understanding of heidegger and his silence of nazi uh killing and um, our sociologist friend pierre burdo has written a work called political ontology of martin heidegger so therefore you know heidegger and saran and so yes we can learn a lot with heidegger in uh, fact i beg to i beg to speak out <clears throat> i beg to express myself professor saran if you look into his all contributions published and unpublished materials particularly i i like you to refer to philosophy of perennis and metonia professor sharma was referring to he as a matter of fact he never remained under the influence of heidegger's understanding and the perspective 
understanding of metonia. And that consumes a lot period of time. Because underlying all these forms of uh, universalism, Professor Sharon talks about, is the modern belief that, uh, and hope also, in the historical actualization of universal social order or religion. On the basis of uh, formulable ultimate knowledge that he talks about, uh, he talks in terms of the postulates of indefinite universal knowability. And that uh, for explication, and it's another half an hour time. <laughs> but the time given to me was only half an hour. So I was not, that's why I uh, left it untouched. I came to the point which I was supposed to speak on that is, sociology in India, the crisis within, and the tradition and the dynamics of relationship between tradition and the modernity. Uh, there I invited, I like to position uh, Professor Mr. A.K. Kumar Swami. He remained uh, much more influenced right from his childhood, right from his teens age, that is from 17 itself. And uh, in, even in the old days when his wife was dead and he was invited uh, some part of some universities of America, there he met uh, his wife, Kumar Swami's wife, uh, Kumar Swami's wife invited him and his student uh, for the lunch and dinner. And that was a beautiful conversation. So unless you focus, I'm going to bring back uh, these materials, the conversations at one hand and the certain kinds of contributions that Professor Sharon himself has met, which unfortunately remain even today unpublished. Unfortunately, I'm in position of all these materials with me at the moment. It is not possible for you to discuss and to focus on uh, in Saran's framework, the time and space meaning, the meaning of time and space, what he means by that. Because this has a very powerful uh, ingredients and the parameters for understanding Saran's sociology. But anyway, I have uh, deliberately withdrawn for, from this kind of discussions because of the positive time that requires a time which is called as around one and a half hours for that. But my friend has given me only half an hour to speak on. So, so, so Pande, Pande, thank you. And time and eternity, the dance together. Half an hour also is a glimpse <laughs> of the eternal. <laughs> and, but but and, I'm impressed by Professor Sharma's uh, uh, presentations. That's beautiful presentation by Professor Sharma. And uh, mm. was tried in the sense that uh, he has uh, uh, drawn, the, uh, uh, drawn the materials from all, uh, uh, you know, the perspectives available in Indian uh, Indology, and that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, I have one one objection. Uh, I was not the speaker. There was one presentation, and my uh, I was just a discussion, and uh, I should be treated as the footnote to uh, Professor Pandey's already <laughs> circulated uh, paper. I have serious objection. I was not uh, the speaker. I was not the presenter. I just provided the footnote to Professor Pandey's very beautiful, eloquent, sophisticated presentation. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and and it is it is it, it, this this industry should not be done to me. Uh, today was that, that, the day of Professor Pandey. That, that, I was that, and I was just the footnote. You are you are uh, not criticizing my paper. As a matter of fact, you are talking about rather providing a lot of conceptual materials for improving on the paper that I presented before all of you. I really am indebted. Uh, with that conceptual materials, we can uh, improve the papers that I have presented. That's why I say that your contributions are really marvelous. 
and you deserve a lot of appreciations by the organizers, organizer. Thank you very much, Professor Giri and uh, Professor so, Gautam. So thank you, Professor Pande. And uh, in, the, in terms of just in, in terms of widening the terms, you kindly uh, put off your video and speak because your video is not working properly. Put off the so, video and you speak. Only you speak. Put off the video. Some okay. problems? With your, yes, please. So now both you, both of you refer to Kumaraswamy, but how do we engage with Kumaraswamy and Ekesharan? This kind of incompatibility of tradition and modernity in the context of other efforts, engagement with tradition and modernity. And I will just leave it as a thought to meditate. Sri Aurobindo and Radha Krishna. And Sri both Aurobindo and Radha Krishna, there is also engagement with both tradition and modernity. And as you are talking about a comparative, uh, uh, you know, engagement with thoughts. So we also need to understand, uh, you know, Kumaraswamy uh, in the context of similar efforts in uh, thinking about India and the world from Sri Aurobindo and Radha Krishna. And with Sri Aurobindo, there is not a fundamental incompatibility between tradition and modernity. So therefore, what we take for granted, Saran's critical modernity must also be open to a related critique. And this is my submission. And the whole question of intercivilizational dialogue Yet when we make civilization the unit of sociological analysis, there is also a question of interaction, communication, and mobilization. So these two thoughts I just wish to leave for us to meditate. Thank so you, Amit, baby. would you like Amit, would you like to share some thought on this, please? Uh, uh, yes, I agree with you that uh, uh, Saran's critique of modernity will not apply to Sri Arvindo and also Chitaranjan Das of Odisha for two reasons, because these people uh, were, you know, uh, uh, doing uh, independent uh, meditations on uh, space, time, life and civilization. And they use a terminology which is not necessarily, you know, conditioned by uh, the university syllabuses. Therefore, uh, for example, when you are reading Savitri of uh, Sri Aurobindo, I think both tradition and modernity become not only complementary to each other, but uh, it is like a yugal bandi of tabla and saroj. Uh, I think uh, both are open-ended, tradition and modernity, but the basic difference between, uh, you know, J.P.S. Uberai on the one hand and uh, Kumar Swami on the other is that J.P.S. Uberai and many like him think that modernity can be understood only through the language of science, physics, Newtonian physics. Uh, for example, but uh, Saran thinks uh, like uh, Kumar Swami and uh, many other people uh, which has been uh, mentioned as the camp follower, that it is art which is more capable, uh, you know, uh, exemplary uh, subject of a study or object of a study than science because art is, you know, a whole, a whole, a symbolic whole the sacred, which also includes science and technology or craft as an element. Therefore, for Sri Aurobindo, art, you know, for example, uh, a novel or, or epic or a literature, it is not a description of reality or truth, but rather the symbolic representation of pind in Brahman. It is an ongoing conversation, and we also can appreciate that with Professor Obroy on 
But only, it's not only through science, but with Gwete. Gwete was an embodiment we both had, but we'll continue our conversation. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Ananta. The FPS always said that uh, Gwete was primarily a scientist. Out of 10 books, 9 books are in botany, and only one book is the, is the book of poetry. Whereas in the case of Isaac Newton, there are 40 books and 39 books are in the field of Christian theology and Principia Mathematica is the 40th book. That is one book out of 40 is in science and therefore this is the classification of Goethe uh, as a poet and Newton as a scientist that is problematic from the point of view of traditionalists like Saran, Nastra, Marco Pallis, René Gueno, uh, Count Kesserling, uh, Tilio Tolstoy, John Ruskin, et al. The conversation, but with Goethe there was no reason between science and art. So Goethe embodied an integration of science and art. But uh, we'll uh, continue our conversation. So, dear friends, I think slowly we are being embraced by the keys of time. And now I invite Minati to please offer her things. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Anantabai. You can put your video. Hello, I hope I'm already, I'm visible also now. Yes. Yeah. So, thank you, Anantabai. Uh, on behalf of Sadhya Sahachakra and Vishwanidam Center for Asian Blue Swimming, I'm Minati Pradhan. Thank our chief speaker, Professor Rajit Pandey, for his very continued presentation on AK Saran and very insightful deliberation. We thank you so much, sir. We learned so much too in today's uh, webinar also. I also thank our moderator and mentor, Professor Anand Kumar Giri, for providing us this platform to learn and uh, to engage in different dimensions of sociology and different things. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Anand Bhai. And I thank our discussion, Professor Amit Kumar Sharma, for his many insights and many uh, dimensions of uh, discussing things. So thank you, sir. Thank you for your discussion. I thank Dr. Maruf Shah for his, he actually discussed so many points which can actually lead to some further discussions. And uh, thank you, sir. And I thank Professor Ganluji as always for his insightful uh, um, deliberation. I thank Professor Tanya Kachutkova also for her questions and for her active participation. At the last, not the least, I thank our convener, Randhir Kumar Gautam, for planning, executing, and uh, doing all these things. It's very um, particular manner. And I thank all the participants in our Zoom platform and in the Facebook platform. I thank you all. Pardon me if I have forgotten anybody's name. And thank you all. Good night. Thanks.